Okay, so we'll go ahead and get going. Um, wanted to point out this was kind of cool. We're going to talk about filtering today and how to extract parts of signal that you want and get rid of parts of signal that you don't want. This is the deviation from a perfect orbit in the CERN ring, the Large Hadron Collider, the particle accelerator they've got. This long period signal you see is the Earth tide actually gravitationally deflecting the ring. So the ring is warping slightly. And this is the earthquake that was in New Zealand on Sunday. So it's about the magnitude of the gravitational tide and deflecting the ring of CERN. Uh, you can't really see on this plot because it's a crappy screenshot from a, a newspaper in the UK, but there's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. It's about um, a part in a million deflection, roughly on there. And see, it looks really clean. But if you were a beamline scientist here, or if, you want, if you're looking at Earth's gravitational tide, say you're interested in this part of the signal and not so much this, so you don't want to filter that out. If you're a seismologist and we're looking at something, you might want to get this, but filter the long periods out. So that's part of what we're going to talk about today is how to effectively do that. And what we're going to do today and Thursday are going to be a little bit different because we're actually going to do a lecture on the board instead of with slides. Uh, so I just need to pull something up here so I can blank the projector because we're going to use it again towards the end uh, for a demo. All right, so go ahead and put the screen up. How many people have had a signal processing or time series class? One? Okay. So. <laughs> so how many people have filtered signals before? Okay, yeah. And filtering is one of these things that's really important to understand because if you don't understand what you're doing, it's very easy to deceive yourself. Uh, there have been some papers published in the past where filtering artifacts have made them draw false conclusions that they later had to retract. Uh, so if you don't know what you're doing, it can be a very bad thing. So, and if you guys need it larger or anything, let me know. So the goal of filter is to remove unwanted signal components. and enhance the wanted components. And what you want and what you don't want are up to you. So if we were to look at some kind of raw unfiltered signal, it could be something that we're measuring in the lab. You know, maybe it's going to look like that, right? And if we put that into our filter that we've designed, on the output, we can get a couple things. Like that plot that I just showed you, we could try to remove this high frequency noise where we get this, this nice sine wave. Maybe that's what we're looking for. Or if we don't care about that long-term trend, if we're really after the little deviations on there, we can get rid of it and just get those variations that are riding on top of that signal. So there are two types, main types, of filters. Does anybody have a guess as to what they are, know what they are? So, yeah, we're not quite there yet, but yes, yeah, so there's low pass, high pass. There's also uh, band pass and band stop and all that. But mainly we're talking about whether we're going to be filtering the signal uh, in hardware or in software, basically, right? So there are two types of filters. So the first is going to be an analog filter. An analog filter 
uses, unsurprisingly, analog components uh, to filter a signal including resistors, capacitors, inductors, and op amps. So op amps and all the stuff that we've talked about in terms of theory of like resistor dividers and all that, it's all going to come back. This all builds on each other. So that's why we're trying to make sure that everybody has a good handle on that. Because if not, none of this is going to make a lot of sense. So if you have questions along the way, please, please stop me. Okay, so if one type of filter is an analog filter, does anybody have a guess as to what the other one is? Digital. Digital, yeah, okay. So a digital filter. So a digital filter filters a signal mathematically inside a processor. Be it a general purpose PC or DSP, which is a digital signal processor. So you can buy specific chips called DSPs that will do all kinds of filtering on board. We're going to talk more about digital filters later. Uh, towards the very end, because that's one thing that we do commonly now with our data after we collect in the lab. But analog filters definitely still have a place and you should be using them in your designs, maybe even some of you in your projects. Okay, so the common filtering scenario. Okay, so we measure something with a system that has an imperfect response. And we're going to call the response function of the system g of omega with noise superimposed. Okay, so any time that you have a transducer, an amplifier, an analog to digital converter, anything that we've talked about, it has a response function. It does not perfectly mirror the world around it. So I seismologists have to apply instrument corrections to the seismometers to take the effect of the seismometer out. Because remember, it's source, path, and instrument all convolved to give you the raw recorded seismogram, for example. So what we really end up having is pure signal. This is ideally what's coming in from the world. And then we have noise, which we've talked about and ways to help eliminate it. And they get added together. They get fed into this box, our, our system, our measurement system that has response G of W. And then we get output. And that's what we record. So what we want to do is get rid of this and get rid of this and get as close as we can to actually estimating uh, what the pure signal is. We're going to reconstruct it. We're never going to reconstruct it perfectly, but maybe we can get close. All right. So a typical filtering workflow, sort of if you will, uh, is going to involve measuring, filtering, amplifying, recording, all of that. But in what order you do this in can make a pretty big difference. And again, if you don't do the proper filtering before you record, as we'll talk about, you can get into deep trouble. So first, we typically measure. Then we would filter, amplify. 
then we record. And now, after the experiment's over, we're analyzing and we're post filtering. And then you finally get back to what you want to do in the first place, which is drawing your conclusion from your data about the science or the system. So, Yeah, so it would be before you record it on the computer, yeah. Yeah, so this would be like you have a load cell and you're connected to an amplifier, like an instrumentation amplifier, and some filtering, hopefully, and then you record it. Yeah. So there's filtering in two spots, right? So we're filtering here and we're filtering here. These two places, we have different goals with the filtering. This one is to make sure that we're recording as much the highest signal to noise ratio that we can without killing anything that we might be interested in. And to make sure that we're not having problems like aliasing and things that are going to make our data invalid, really, if we're looking at it. Now out here, we're playing with, well, what if we limit to this frequency band or this frequency band? We're trying to pull out certain things out of the data. We're not really trying to prevent ourselves from having incorrect data there. So. A lot of times, I would say the, the first, the filter amplify stage is done in hardware and most of the time the analyzed post filter you're doing in software, so MATLAB, Python, SAC, whatever analysis tool you're using. So a question that some people will say, and I've said things very similar to this, uh, but you have to be very particular when you say it, is they'll say, well, why filter before recording? So, why filter before recording? Just record everything. So, they're saying, we're going to record really fast, and then we're going to do all of our filtering and post-processing after the experiment is done. And I'm going to, to put this in red because it's important. So information about the signal is lost forever during digitization and recording. So there are some things that when we record the signal, if we record at 100 hertz, let's say, and there are components of the signal that are above 50 hertz, or really more like above 20 hertz if you want to get realistic about how data works, they're gone. They're aliased into the signal in an irrecoverable way. You'll never know what effect they had on it. So you're recording things that could be lying to you, right? So. Let's say, let's see, let's say a common one in the lab when we're loading our samples, we're looking at pretty long periods, right? You know, we're loading things over seconds, which in the electrical world is forever, uh, to minutes to hours. So let's say we had wideband noise on a slowly varying signal. So that would require a high recording rate, right? Otherwise, we would alias all that high frequency noise in. So have people looked at spectra before? So a frequency amplitude plot? Looking at the spectra signal? Okay. We'll do that in a little bit then. Uh, we'll go into it now. Uh, the other one is, let's say you had wideband noise on a narrowband signal. So wideband noise on a narrowband signal. And 
greatly reduces the signal to noise ratio. So you've got noise at many, many frequencies and you're really only interested in this little band of frequencies. So you're corrupting your entire thing. You're getting a much lower signal to noise ratio than you could with just a little bit of filtering before you recorded. And a lot of times, you know, in the lab, let's say that you're interested in things that are happening with a stick slip event that takes place over a few milliseconds. Really, you would need to be recording in the many hundreds of kilohertz to megahertz to effectively characterize that stick slip without aliasing noise in unless you filter correctly. Okay. Any questions so far? We haven't really got into the the hows yet. So is that in order to get, uh, for example, the stick slip signal or the real estate fit signal, you need to record that in megahertz? Oh, so not to get, to get just the peak, you know, maybe, I don't know, a few kilohertz might do it, depending on your, your slip rate. But you've got high frequency noise that's on that signal. And all that's going to be aliased into the recording unless you record very fast so you can filter it out later. Yeah. Okay. So, rules of filtering. And these are according to me. So, there's not, this isn't necessarily written in a textbook. I'm going to call these more rules of thumb. Uh, the first rule is do no harm to your signal. Uh, so if you don't understand, stop immediately. Because if you don't understand what you're doing with filters, if you're applying an eighth order Bessel filter and you don't know what any of those things mean, that means you're doing harm to your signal because you're probably doing things to it that you don't fully understand and you're going to lead yourself astray. Uh, two, filter out known sources only if there is no expected signal at that frequency. And a good example of this is 60 hertz AC hum. So the power lines that are in the walls, the AC is alternating at 60 cycles a second, 60 hertz. That often shows up on data. If you just hold a wire out in the air and hook it up to an oscilloscope, you will pick up a 60 hertz sine wave that's inductive coupling from the power lines in the walls to your system. If you do not have any signal that you're looking for that is around the 60 hertz portion, you should filter that out because it's just going to be extra noise on the signal that you're recording. If you have something that you're interested in near 60 hertz, you have to live with it, uh, which can be fun. Okay. Three. Filter systematics and noise that degrade system response. So maybe you've got a noise source and you're controlling off of a load cell or a DCDT that has some noise on the signal. If you're controlling off of that noise, then you don't have very good control of the system, right? So if there's some noise or some kind of systematic thing, uh, that's going to degrade how your system's performing, you should obviously make that a priority to filter out. Uh, number four, remember the Nyquist limit and never, ever, ever, ever approach it. So the Nyquist limit is what? Yes. So you need to sample at least twice as fast as the highest frequency thing that you're trying to measure. That is in an ideal, perfectly ideal world. 
with real signals that have real noise on them. If you're sampling, I would say a factor of four to five, uh, you're in good shape. If you're sampling any less than that, you're probably going to be aliasing noise in. Uh, there would be some seismologists that would tell you that you should even not go more than a factor of 10. A little excessive for what we do in the lab most of the time, I think. Okay. And the last rule of signal filtering is filter systems to only respond over their dynamic linear range. So you want to make sure that if you have some instrument that has a frequency response that's linear and then gets kind of crazy and nonlinear at the ends, you want to make sure that you're filtering what comes out of that sensor so that you're only seeing what's in that linear range because that's the only thing you can trust unless you have a complete characterization of the sensors. You know, I'm talking poles and zeros, and you can do the whole seismology type correction on it, which everything that you buy from a manufacturer you don't have. So you need to make sure that you're in a linear frequency response band. Otherwise, once again, you're going to fool yourself. We'll see an example in a little bit. So you need to sample faster, otherwise you'll alias, right? So if you're interested in a signal that has a period of 20 hertz, you should sample at about 100 hertz. Uh, so more than 40 hertz is right. Yeah, 40 hertz is the theoretical minimum, and you always want to go above that by quite a bit, as much as you can afford to uh, in terms of hardware or storage space. Okay. Actually, we're going to erase. Everybody have those, I hope? Okay. So, the next thing, now that we know the rules of filtering, is to talk about the types of filters that you can apply. And this is what some of you were saying earlier when we started. So, things like low pass and high pass. I'm going to draw real filter responses. Uh, ideally, you know, a low pass or a high pass has a very sharp cutoff. It's like a box car. And there is no such thing in real life as a filter that's infinitely sharp. So I'm going to draw kind of real responses for you. So types of filtering. Okay, low pass. And people get low pass and high pass mixed up a lot especially when you're swapping back and forth between you're talking about the filter has a corner frequency of 100 hertz or a corner period of 10 seconds. You know, that's, that inverse relation can really mess you up. But this passes frequencies lower than some cutoff F sub C. Now we're going to get into looking at some of these spectra. So we have amplitude and frequency. Generally, this is a log-log plot. We plot amplitude in decibels, which is a logarithmic scale, and we plot frequency logarithmically as well. So if you were to look at the response of a low-pass filter, it looks something like that. And right here would be the corner frequency. So you notice it's not a sharp edge. We would say everything in here is passed. Everything in here is blocked. But you see it doesn't just go to zero, right? There's this slope. And we'll talk about what that slope is. It's called the falloff rate or falloff. Um, this would be referred to as kind of the corner of the filter. You know, F sub C is not way back here where we start deviating. In electrical work, we generally define it as the point where the signal is three decibels below where it started. So this would be minus three dB. If you do the math, that's about 70.7%. So when this falls to 70% of what it was, that's where we define the corner frequency to be. 
All right, similarly, high pass passes frequencies higher than some cutoff F sub C. If we were to make that plot, of frequency and amplitude. It's going to look like the mirror image of that plot, basically. So we're passing high frequencies, we're blocking low frequencies, here we're passing low frequencies and blocking high frequencies. So remember on that plot that I projected at the beginning, if we were interested in the earthquake, we'd use a high pass filter. We'd try to block out that low frequency, long period tidal stuff. If we were interested in the tidal, we'd try to pass it and block out the earthquake. Uh, most of the time, neither of those is totally adequate for the task that you're doing. Hence, we have the band pass, uh, which passes frequencies Uh, between a high and low cutoff if we were to draw it and it's sort of like we smush those two together so we have a cutoff here and we have a cutoff here so this center section is what we call the pass band of the filter. Yeah. Yeah, so we have, we filter out low frequencies below some cutoff and filter high frequencies above some cutoff and we just pass the center section. Now, there's one other kind of filter that gets very little attention, I think, um, which is kind of sad because it's a nice one which is the band stop filter. So the band stop. If this is a narrow band, then you will often hear it called a notch filter, especially when you're talking to electrical engineers. Uh, and so it passes frequencies outside of two cutoffs. So you can think of a band stop looking like that. So there's one cutoff, there's the other. So we, we pass low frequencies, we pass high frequencies, but we block that center section out. This is if you had that 60 hertz AC hum or some very specific frequency of noise that you knew was coming into your system, you hit it with one of these that's centered around that frequency. And that's also what you would do if, you know, like on the biax, AM radios interfering with it, that kind of thing. Okay, any questions on four types of filters? No, all right. So how would we make filters with the components that you have in your kit and what we gave you for the, the amplifier activity? Any guesses? Do we have any components that block AC and pass DC or vice versa? We definitely do, because we're going to do it. Capacitor. Yeah, so a capacitor would generally be considered to let AC through and to block DC. So I'm going to show you single pole filters. At the end, I'll show you one example of a double pole filter. We're not going to get into because of time. Uh, and I didn't know how comfortable people would be going through the derivations, which doing the derivations is not that interesting in itself, but learning about poles and zeros and how multipole filters actually work. Um, if you get into that, you'll need to learn it. So we're going to look at simple single pole passive filters. So an analog filtering world there are two types of filters. There's a passive filter and there's an active filter. We're going to look at both. A passive filter uses just passive components, resistors, capacitors, 
and inductors. Active filters can use things like op amps. Okay, so if I draw a filter that has an input, some resistance R1, an output, and a capacitor that goes to ground, some capacitance, C1, what kind of filter would that be, do you think? Remember, capacitors tend to conduct AC and block DC. It's a low pass. Yeah, so this is a low pass filter. So we're going to do a little bit of analysis. Does anybody recognize this circuit if I do that? It's a voltage divider. They come back over and over and over. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to get comfortable with them. It is a voltage divider. If you don't see it like that, then draw the circuit like this, right? Out, in. So that looks kind of like the voltage divider that we saw before. So if I do have a voltage divider, Let's say this is R1 and this is R2. What's the formula for that voltage divider? It should be like ingrained by now. All right, so V out is Vn, R2 over R1 plus R2. So this looks similar to that. We're going to change this equation a little bit now. Because remember last time, maybe it's time before last, we talked about inductance, right? We said that inductance is the vector sum of resistance and reactance. So you can replace those with Zs, and it's the same thing. It's the same equation for this. These have effectively no reactance. The capacitor does have some reactance, though. So get rid of that. The reactance of a capacitor, which I think was in one of the slides, but I know they've we're flying by quickly. It's 1 over 2 pi frequency times the capacitance of the capacitor. And we know that inductance was the vector sum, let's see, we're calling that x squared, like that. So if you plug that in to the equation that we've got for a voltage divider, where we have the resistance are the impedance of this, and then we have the impedance of the entire chain, we get that V out is X sub C, or Vn, times X sub C over the square root R squared plus X sub C squared, which we can simplify to Vn X sub C over the total impedance of the circuit. Okay, so we're going to try this out. Let's say that I have a filter so there's out, there's ground. Up here I have a 4.7 K resistor. Down here I have a 47 nanofarad capacitor, and then I put a sine wave in that has an amplitude of 10 volts. If that sine wave is 100 hertz, what is V out? So calculate. So at 100 hertz. The first step is going to be calculate the reactance of the capacitor. So when somebody has that, let me know.
right. 100 hertz and 47 times 10 to the minus 9 farads. What was it, Peter? Yes, 33863. And what are the units of reactants? Talked about it last time. They're in ohms. So it's the frequency dependent resistance of the capacitor. So at that frequency, that capacitor looks like a 33.8K resistor. Kind of cool. Okay, we plug that into our V out equals Vn xc over root r squared plus xc squared, and what do you get? We just calculated X sub C. We know this is 10, and we know this is 4.7 kilo ohms. Carrie's frantically typing single handed parentheses. Mm -hmm. Said so you're frantically typing single handed parentheses here to calculate this. It's not. It's what? So it's it's 9.9 .9 volts, which basically means it's 10, right? We're pretty close. Now, if you do the same calculation, which I won't make you do right now, so we don't run out of time here. Uh, if we do it at 10 kilohertz, you would find that X sub C is 338.6 ohms. So the, capac the reactance of the capacitor went down. And that now the voltage out is 0 0.718 volts. So as the frequency goes up, the voltage coming out of this goes down. That's how this is a low pass filter, right? It's just, it's just a resistor divider, except this resistor changes as a function of frequency. So how can we describe the filter with roughly a single number? Uh, we can talk about the cutoff frequency of the filter. We're not going to go through the derivation of it, but I will tell you that the cutoff or corner frequency is 1 over 2 pi RC. So 1 over 2 pi times the resistance times the capacitance. So what is the cutoff frequency of this filter? And we'll see if it makes sense with what we just calculated. It's easy. You're plugging in two numbers that are right there. So FC is 720 hertz for that filter. So it makes sense, right? We plugged in 100 hertz, and we got something that was almost not reduced or not attenuated, you would hear it referred to as at all. We went out to 10 kilohertz, and we got something that was significantly reduced or attenuated. Uh, this fall off, the slope of that for an RC filter, a single pole RC filter like we just drew, is 20 decibels per decade. Or that's uh, six decibels per octave, whichever you're more comfortable thinking in, decades or octaves. 
I use decades, but uh, the phase shift for this, which these filters do induce phase shifts, and we're going to plot that for a real one in a little bit. But if you want to calculate the phase shift, it's minus arc tan 2 pi FRC. Okay. So do you think if on a theoretical quiz you had to calculate the output voltage for a given input waveform, you could do that <coughs> given the formulas? Okay. You're still not getting the right numbers? Yeah, 47 nanofarad and 4.7 kilo ohms. 4,700 4, 4, 4, ohms. 4.7 to 3. Yeah. So, yeah, 724. Okay. Yeah. So, decimal point there. It's probably, probably my fault on that one. Sorry. Okay. So, if that's a low pass, does anybody have a guess how we can make a high pass? using the same pieces. Yes. So, if this is low, a high pass filter, if I erase the board so you can see it, it's going to have an input, there's going to be a capacitor, a resistor to ground. It's an American resistor too. And then an output. It is an American resistor, yes. We <laughs> did the squiggly line. So here the voltage out, you go through the same exercise. Now we have, remember that total impedance term is up here now instead of down here where R2 is. Uh, it's going to be Vn, the resistance over the total impedance of the string. That's a little bit easier to calculate. Uh, does this look similar to anything that we talked about with the op amp mathematical operation stuff? Because you can very effectively make this a differentiator pretty easily. It's very similar to that. Uh, so we're coupling the high frequency stuff through the capacitor, the AC, right to the output, and we're taking all the DC component to ground through this resistor. So that is the high pass filter. These types of filters, you'll often see them referred to in electrical engineering stuff as L filters. Uh, there are, if you throw inductors in the mix, which we're not going to do because we haven't really talked about inductors, uh, you can get like a pi filter, which is so-called because it looks like a pi on a schematic. It looks like the pi symbol. Uh, and there are T filters as well that look like Ts. So there are all kinds of different filter arrangements that you can get. Uh, if you look in the art of electronics, there's a a pretty hefty section on all of this. Okay. What about a bandpass filter? How could we make a bandpass filter with the same components? Yep. Exactly. So we're just going to combine a low and a high pass filter. So bandpass filter. An input capacitively coupled resistor going down there resistor there capacitor and an output so we got C1 R1 R2 C2 so right we've got our high pass and then we're following the high pass with a low pass filter there Comfortable so, so far? Okay. Now, these filters have some disadvantages. We can calculate, in fact, you did, uh, the impedance of it. These can be relatively low impedance, which if you're connecting this to something like a load cell, directly that could be a problem. All right? There's no buffering going on. You could load down whatever you're filtering. You could drag its output around. So, 
we then can make some basic active filters. Now, a low pass active filter. We have our input, a resistor, we have an op amp that goes into the inverting. Out. So R one, C one, R two. So that is the configuration of an active low pass filter. Notice this is also an inverting filter. You can do it in a non inverting configuration if you want a little bit more complicated, so I stuck with the invertings for the drawings here on the board. Uh, the corner frequency of this guy, we're not going to derive it. It's 1 over 2 pi, R2C1, so it's set by these guys right in here. The gain, which this is another advantage of active filters, is not only can you roll off the parts of the signal you don't want, you can gain up the parts that you do, is R2 over R1. It's exactly what it is for a normal inverting amplifier configuration. Okay. A high pass filter. We're going to have our input. Capacitor comes first this time, right? Then a resistor. Very similar setup. So C1, R1, R2. Corner frequency of this one. 1 over 2 pi R1, C1. And the gain is again R2 over R1. So remember, we can gain things and we're buffering all in one stage here. There's a schematic. I don't think anybody used this part. There's a part, the HB100, it's a little radar module that you can get for a few bucks. They do a lot of this kind of filtering in their recommended parts. It's, it's the one I used in the example project, uh, the, the speed trap project. Uh, if you look at their schematic, it's got a lot of these things chained together. And conveniently enough, this still says bandpass filter, so we'll just draw the active bandpass filter right here. It is a combination of those two. So we have C1, R1, C2, R2. The formulas are going to be the same. As those, so I'm not going to write them out again. This is a tricky thing to do, though, because you have two corner frequencies and a gain. So you need to solve for R1, R2, C1, and C2, and you have three equations. Uh, uh oh, that's a problem. You can pick something and try to adjust everything else to get matching values that give you the filter you want. That doesn't always happen very easily. So a more common approach, I would say. If you can do this, that's great. You're a wizard of analog filter design. And sometimes the numbers just work out where you can get parts that are easy to do that with. I would say most of the time, I would go with an architecture like this. Right, so we've got So we have the two filters. We have the high pass and the low pass just chained together in line. You get a little bit of additional noise because there's another amplifier in the line. Most of the time it makes the design so much easier. It doesn't really matter. And if you want to calculate corner frequency, well, you just do it with those formulas. Okay, that's analog filtering. 
basic analog filtering. Uh, let's see, do we have, I don't have in here. I'm going to draw it real quick because I'm going to show you before the end of class uh, multipole filters. If people ever looked at like a poles and zeros file for a filter, seismometer, an instrument, anything like that. No. Okay. The filter that we drew before, this filter, plain old low pass RC filter. So we've got out and in. This is what we call a single pole filter that has that roll off of 20 decibels per decade. If you now add a second one, with the same characteristics on the end, you now have created what's known as a two-pole filter. This has a roll-off of, can anybody guess it? It's 40 decibels per decade. So you get twice as sharp of a knee. And you can go crazy with this. Like, especially there are chips now, some of these digital signal processing chips, that on a chip for $7, you can implement an eight-pole Bessel filter that you set the corner frequency of with one capacitor. It's wonderful. You don't have to do some pretty crazy analog design to get a pretty sharp filter corner. And like I said, we're going to look at these. Yeah, we'll go ahead and do it now before we switch to digital. So you won't be able to see, but on my breadboard up here, I have built that circuit we just had drawn. I have a single pole and a double pole filter that are low pass. So while I'm hooking up, somebody should calculate, or well, y'all should, the corner frequency. I have a 330 ohm resistor and I have a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. So let me know what the corner frequency is going to be. Point 0.1 microfarads. And in theory, that should be showing up there, but it's not. Okay, is this show? It just, it, before class, it worked. So, of course, it's not going to now. It says the source is HDMI. Yeah. Let me try again. Does anybody have the corner frequency yet? So, so something like five kilohertz, roughly. Okay, well, what I've got up here is I have what's called, it, well, it's a National Instruments MIDAC, but I'm using it as a bode plot instrument. And let me run this test, and then I will just bring it around and show you. So what this is going to do is it's going to put a sine wave of a fixed amplitude and sweep through a range of frequencies from... 100 hertz up to 10 kilohertz. And it's going to measure the amplitude of that output sine wave and the phase of it. And it's going to make a plot for us. We'll go up to 20 kilohertz. Oh, that looked like maybe magic. Um, display. So it's two, I think. So it's mirroring. Uh, let's see. 
Okay, we're going to try changing the resolution here and see if we can project. No. Okay, we'll try this next time. <laughs> I'll make sure it works. Uh, Yeah, I mean, do it towards the end, maybe. Um, so we'll show you measuring the response of an RC filter. Sorry, that didn't work right now. It's the wonders of the projectors in this room. Uh, let's see, eraser. Okay, so the next type of filter is digital filtering, which we said we normally do post processing. So we've collected our data that was pre-filtered properly because we followed the six rules of filtering. And now we want to do a little bit of digital signal processing on it, or maybe we're even doing some digital signal processing in our circuit. So digital filters. The way that digital filters work, first we have our unfiltered signal. And that goes into our analog to digital converter, which you all know all about from reading the websites that Chris sent out. Okay. The output from the analog to digital converter is going to go into a processor and houses our filter, but the output from that Remember, now we're going to have a discrete samples. So a little bit of noise on there. So there's our sine wave, discreetly sampled. Now, out of the processor is going to come the digitally filtered version of that signal. So now if we're trying to filter off that high frequency noise, we have a nice clean sine wave coming out. And to go back out to the world, it goes through a digital to analog converter, which outputs the filtered signal, which looks like that if you did everything right in between. There's a lot of steps that happen here, right? take the signal, we digitize it, we filter it with some math inside a processor, and then we turn it back into an analog signal. If you're doing this at high frequencies, this has to happen like that. In fact, uh, FPGAs, these field programmable gate arrays, can do this very close to instantly on multiple channels. Uh, it hasn't always been that way. <laughs> there have been times where you couldn't do things in the radio frequency band this way like you can now. So some of the benefits, one, and I'll just put a keyword up here and then describe a little bit about it. They're programmable. So you can put this digital signal processing chip in your circuit. It's doing all of this. And if you decide you want to change your corner frequency, if you want to add a, a little notch filter to filter out some 60 hertz AC hum or whatever, you just add it to the program flash it to the chip, and you're done. You don't have to do a lot of analog redesign. You're not trying to find what values of resistors and capacitors do you have in your box that you can cram together to make this work. OK, so related, they're easy to design and test and implement. I underline test because you should test your filters, whether analog or not, to make sure they're not messing with parts of your signal that you don't know about, that you don't understand. Uh, the cool thing is with this, you just need a laptop. Most of these uh, signal processing chips, these DSPs, have a program that you load on your laptop. You can feed in a signal. It simulates the chip. It tells you what the output's going to be. And it, they do a really good job of modeling what happens in the chip. So you don't even have to build any hardware. 
to understand what's going on. Uh, three, stable. We know analog components because you looked at the data sheets. Drift with temperature and with time. Op amps might have a gain drift over the years, or as the temperature in the lab changes, their gain is, or offset will change slightly. It doesn't happen with math that's happening in a processor. So these are much less susceptible to extreme temperature variations, and they're much less susceptible to drift over time. Uh, excellent frequency range. You will quickly see when you're trying to design analog filters that doing really low frequency stuff is a pain. These DSP chips do low frequency work amazingly well. So we'll use on seismometers when we're filtering out high frequency stuff. And we're looking for things like normal modes of the earth that are thousands of seconds. Uh, the RF side, the really high frequency side like gigahertz and even terahertz are becoming possible now with the advances in the technology. Okay, five, versatile. This is different than being programmable. If you design an analog filter, generally except for very, very advanced filter designs, it has a corner frequency. It has a response curve. These, you can make them adapt to the signal. If they can lock onto some kind of signal, you can have them track it. You can have the filter adapt to the current noise environment. So these filters can be adaptive and you don't have to touch them if you're clever about how you program them. Uh, and six is compact. If you're designing a complicated filter or a string of filters for many channels of data, you could have a lot of op amps, a lot of resistors, a lot of capacitors, a lot of things to go wrong. And it takes up a lot of board space. Digital signal processing chips are generally one chip with a few maybe decoupling capacitors around them. So it takes less boardroom, it's easier for you to design, and it has all of these other five advantages as well. Okay, the order of a digital filter is something that you'll see. I know people that do filtering in MATLAB uh, have to pick the order of the filter they're gonna use, and most of the time, just pick some arbitrarily high number, and if it works, that's great. But if you know what it means, things suddenly make a lot more sense. So, filter order. Okay, the order of a digital filter is the number of previous inputs used to calculate the current output. So remember, you have this discrete, you can think of it like an array that's stored in the digital signal processor. And the number of previous values before what you're looking at, that's the order of the filter. So a zero order, can anybody think of what a zero order filter would be? gain. If you take a number that comes in that's 5 volts and you multiply it by 5 and you get 25 out, the next number that comes in is 2 volts, you multiply it by 5 and you get 10 out, that's a zero order filter. You're not using any previous data. You're just using the data that you collected at that time alone. First order. So now we're using one previous point. This could be like a pure delay filter if you want to introduce some delay in your system, you can take in the current point, put out the point that you had before it. Uh, a two-term difference so derivative with two points or a two-term average like a running average of two numbers. Those would be first order filters. When you do a running average, you're really just doing, you're doing digital signal processing of the nth order, and you can actually introduce some interesting artifacts. Uh, second order, we're using two previous points. So this would be like a three-term average 
Or who remembers their numerical methods, how you take a derivative of something with three points? It's a central difference. Yeah. Okay. The last thing that we're going to talk about before we desperately try to get the demos to work is recursive and non-recursive digital filters. Something that will really, and I'm going to show you an example that I know will work because it's on my Mac, of how a non-recursive filter really messed up a project I was working on and caused a lot more work for me because I didn't read a data sheet carefully. And it was a gigantic, gigantic pain. Okay, so non-recursive filters. They calculate their output. based only on current and previous data or previous input values. When you're in MATLAB, again, and you're using that filter toolkit, you remember seeing the terms FIR and IIR, finite impulse response and infinite impulse response filters? This is FIR. FIR is another way to say non-recursive filter. So we're only using current and past data, nothing else. A recursive filter calculates output based on the inputs and previous output values. So it can have current data, it can have data from the past, and it has the output of the filter from the previous step. So some of the filter's output gets fed forward. This is known as an IIR, or infinite impulse response. So think about those two names. If you have a non-recursive filter, and you put an impulse in, you put a spike into the filter. That spike will be in the output of the filter for whatever length the order of your filter is, and then it's gone. The filter knows nothing about it because it's only dealing with the previous values and the current value. Once that window slides off the spike, it's done. A recursive filter is continually feeding its output back into itself. So that spike will always be in the output of the filter signal, just in reducing amounts. So in theory, the spike is in there for infinity time. In practicality and limits of numerics and computing, it's in there for some very long time, and then it goes away. But these have very different responses. The spikes, large spikes, can stay in this kind of filter quite a bit longer than short ones. So you might say, why use a recursive filter? Because that sounds like a pretty nasty thing. If you're trying to implement a specific filter design, you generally have to have fewer terms, fewer orders in a recursive filter than in a non-recursive filter to do the exact same operation. Because you have the help of the filter helping itself, the past self helping the future self, if we're personifying filters. Um, so the order of a recursive filter is the largest number of previous input or output values required. So it's just how many pieces of data it takes to do it. That's the order. So, any questions on digital filtering? So, for the difference between IR and IR, you mentioned that there's a spike. Mm -hmm. So, can I interpret it as this? So, if you put a spike in your data and you use IFIR, and then the spike um, will be there and be shrinked, but if you use IIR, the spike will be, um, the effect of the spike will, will, will get in. Um, I don't need to necessarily drag it to a square. So it's just that in both of these will do some filtering on the spike, right? But in this filter, you have, let's say we've got data point, data point, data point, data point, spike, data point, data point, data point, data point, data point. And we're running along here with a second order filter. 
So we're looking at these two points, these two points, bang. The spike is going to be in the output of our filter. The spike is going to be in the output of our filter. No spike. The filter's completely forgotten about the spike. Here, once we get to this point, a little bit of the spike will be in every place the filter is because the output of the filter is fed back into itself. In reality, it finally fades out. Mathematically, it's there forever. Yeah. Any other questions? OK. So I'm going to show you, put the screen down. It's all last, last time stuff. Uh, let's see. Make sure got the right one open, yeah. OK. So this is an analog to digital converter. It's a 24-bit converter. It's called the Max 11040K. You know, it's something you could name a child relatively easily. Um, way buried in the filter data sheet here, it tells you about a digital filter that is built into the analog to digital converter. And they tell you some things about it. Here you're looking at the gain and the frequency of the input divided by the frequency that you're sampling at. So you can see that roll off that we've talked about. There's our minus 3 dB point out here. But you can see it has an FIR filter with these coefficients built in. So in this particular project, I had a square wave that I was looking at of, I think it was 250 hertz, something like that. It wasn't all that fast. So we have a square wave, pretty straight forward. And what I wanted to know is what is the average voltage down here and the average voltage up here and the average voltage down here and the average voltage up here to read this strange kind of sensor. OK, so I plugged in a function generator to the input of this analog to digital converter. And that's what I got out. And that does not look like a square wave. That looks like Batman on the top. You see, there's the ears. So that's throwing off. I was, I was sampling at a very low rate initially. I was only going to have like three or four data points up here and average those. But I was getting these edge effects in my average. So I sampled way faster and got this. And that, that looks really weird. So I went over uh, to one of my friends that has a very, very nice uh, oscilloscope that costs more than my car did and has a very big bandwidth, hooked up my signal generator to it, and I actually measured what was going into the analog to digital converter, and it did not have Batman ears. So something was happening in the analog to digital converter. I went back and started reading through the data sheet and found that section that I just showed you about the FIR filter that I sort of skimmed over when I was designing the circuit. Turns out that was a very bad decision. So here I just numerically created a perfect square wave. That's the input signal. And these are the filter coefficients from the data sheet. So these are the coefficients that you multiply everything in that moving window by. And it turns out if you the numerical operation would be to convolve, right? So you've got this little array and you convolve it with the large array. If you do that, boom, that's what it looks like numerically when you apply that FIR filter to that perfect square wave. And if you decimate it, like I was trying to do originally, you see that there's mostly trash. You may get one or two data points that tell you the values that you actually want to know. So there's one there and two and two and two and one. It's not going to work very well. And here, the blue is my, my model, my mathematical simulation of what would happen. And the purple is the actual analog to digital converter readings that I was getting from hooking the function generator up. So what I ended up having to do is what I thought was going to be sampling at maybe a kilohertz. Uh, I had to sample at a minimum of eight kilohertz so that I had enough data points in here to get some kind of meaningful average. So I had to sample eight times faster. That made my code a lot harder to write. 
and I was dealing with a lot more data, things just had to happen faster in the hardware because I didn't read the data sheet and understand the FIR filter this was applying. You would think you could turn something like this off. I talked to a support engineer at the manufacturer and no, indeed, you cannot. So other people put filters in the hardware that you buy. And if you don't know what they're doing, you're going to end up measuring something that's not at all what reality is. It's mostly, they, this, they designed this particular chip for audio and those, you know, three or four points of deviation. And the thing is, if you put a sine wave into this, that's actually something that I'll, I'll do and I'll show you next time. If you convolve that filter with a sine wave, you don't see this. Remember, a perfect square wave has tons of high frequency energy in those sharp corners. And it's only when you get up to those really high frequencies that these filters can screw you. So if you saw this in your data, you might say, oh, look, there's some overshoot there. No, it's filter. It didn't actually happen in the physical world ever. So that could be a problem. OK, we'll try one more time to get uh, this bode plot showing. If not, I'll make sure it works for next time. Maybe. Can you remote go back? You mean your map to the... This isn't on the network. Unfortunately, let me go to 800 by 600. We'll really crank the resolution down and see what happens here. I think that's as low as I can go. Yeah, okay, so here's the plan. Next time, I'll show you that, and then we're going to talk about control systems. So we've talked about all kinds of this filtering stuff. We've talked about how to amplify things. Now we need to know how to use what we're measuring to actually control what we're trying to, right? The, be it a hydraulic ram, a pump, uh, whatever, light intensity. So we're going to talk about how to do simple control, like proportional, on-off, we're going to talk about PID control loops, which are how 90% of things that have control loops work. It's how your car's cruise control works. It's also how drones stay stable when they're in the air. Uh, and then there will be Thanksgiving break, so there's a week of nothing for you to work on your projects. Then we have two more lectures. One of those is going to be an activity that you're going to do with PID control and your Arduinos. And then the next one after that will be hydraulics and pneumatics. So we'll talk a little bit about how hydraulics work and what we use for most of our stuff in the labs. And then it's project presentations for the last two class periods. So there's only a couple weeks until project presentations. We'll start, let's look at a, uh, a web page out for people to start to sign up for presentations. Yeah. Schedule it. All right, any questions? Uh, we'll put it up on the site. Yeah, we have to put it up. We're just going to try to make it happen within these two time periods, and we'll just divide it up and see if that works out. It might, it'll probably be something like 15 minutes. Yeah. So okay. we show the project here. Like yeah. yeah. Or we kind of record that and use camera or something. I guess ideally, we're going to see it. Yeah. Oh. It's more fun if we see the hardware. Oh. And besides, it can't not work when other people look at it if it's not here, right? Right. Yeah. All right. Okay. See you. Thursday.